Basically, lead sheathing is a marine growth deterrent. It's kind of like the modern ablative paint you use on your boats. Um, they realized pretty swiftly coming to the new world that the warm tropical temperatures um, had, were a perfect breeding ground for these worm infestations and their ships were just getting annihilated by these things. Um, and so they began developing this um, technique to hammer out thin sheets of lead and then they would place the lead um, against the bottom sides of the hull and then they would coat over that oftentimes with a um, with a veneer of pine tar or various um, some kind of resin and uh, that was an attempt in, in, in attempts to uh, stop or at least alleviate some of the concerns with the shipworm um, and so interestingly enough there's some research that shows that um, lead sheathing was often differentially placed um, uh, they would place most of it on the stern of the ship um, I think this is because the stern was more difficult when careening to repair, and it also had more moving parts and more complex parts. Um, so they would careen the ship and oftentimes redo the forward hull. Um, and so some ships have a predominance of lead sheathing towards the stern. Other ships, you start to see the patches of lead sheathing working its way up towards the bow. Um, and it was basically all just a desperate attempt to try and get a couple more years out of these extremely expensive vessels. Um, uh, I mean, it's amazing. I think some studies showed some of these boats would last five or six years in some of these conditions. And when you put that kind of an expense into building a massive cargo ship and you get five, ten years out of it, you know, I think how many trees in Europe were dead, like the whole forests are gone because of the shipbuilding age, you know. And so they would do everything they could to try and protect their investment. And this lead sheathing is one of the main attempts to protect that investment. Interestingly enough, too, when you have a big, thick Torito crust beneath this lead sheathing, I mean, now this is going out on a limb. This is just a raw hypothesis here, but this uh, Torito crust might be an example of a ship's hull that was so deteriorated that it finally gave way on the passage. Um, it would make sense if when, when ships went down in a major storm, um, it was well recorded, well documented. Many investors lost their, their, their hats. And so it was a very big deal. But when you have these one-off vessels that maybe were going with the, the flotilla and, you know, can you imagine just sailing on the flotilla and seeing the old ship that you guys all thought would make one more trip and you just see it start to go down and there's no stopping. You just have to watch your friends and whoever just go down at sea and there's nothing you can do for them. Um, so you, this, you know, these sort of pieces of information might help us indicate, you know, was this a, a one-off shipwreck? Uh, you know, uh, so the Torito crust is going to be really interesting, especially if we can determine whether or not it was in well, well formed during the historic um, use of the ship, or if this is a post depositional type of uh, thing. So, you know, those sorts of answers will tell us a lot about the, how the ship wrecked, you know, and then how it decomposed. Um, one of the words I like to throw around the office a lot is taphonomy, because I'm really trying to get the guys to wrap their heads around deep time about how the wreck sank and then was deposited and then redeposited and then dissolved. And then, you know, there's this long ongoing process that's continuing underwater right now as we speak with current and with marine growth. And so understanding the taphonomy of the wreck will tell us a lot about the wreck. And uh, most of this is lead sheathing. We do have a little bit of iron that is kind of a obviously underwater environment, the marine environment really changes the chemistry of a lot of these things. So this is an interesting piece of iron. Um, back here we have, which will be, uh, needs to be uh, further examined. This is actually a piece of preserved, we've preserved its iron, wood. There's some, um, what appears to be some kind of maybe hemp rope cordage fragment, and then a nice piece of um, probably sailcloth or, yeah, some kind of tarpaulin. Um, and the, well, we're hoping to get this off. I, I would like to send this to a textile expert and maybe we could learn more about the, the loom that, you know, you know, there's obviously some chemical analysis that could be done here for the resin, um, but this might be a really interesting piece of artifact. A loom, uh, you know, how they wove the material. Mm -hmm. So they would use these different looms to, um, you know, pass um, the, the threads 
through the loom so they could make a certain weave. And a textile expert can look at this and say, oh, that loom was indicative of this period used for this, that, or the other. Um, obviously we need a specialist. Um, and the important thing to remember is that, I mean, this lead sheathing, even our model will tell us within some degree of certainty, maybe it came from Spain or maybe it didn't, but it's not gonna tell us for sure. And even if it did come from Spain, that doesn't mean it's a Spanish ship per se. Um, so this piece of evidence, the lead, and then this piece of um, marine environment evidence, environmental data, the Torito, and then, you know, we take this piece of um, cloth into account. Slowly we start to build through hypotheses and through research, we start to develop a theory about the wreck. Um, we are far from any theories at this point. We are basically in the hypothesizing state and that will take some time. Um, barring a discovery of the ship's bell or some item that clearly identifies the wreck, this is the process of archeology. span It's tedious, it's slow, it's costly, um, but it's the way to do it when you wanna actually do right by the site, so to speak, um, preserve it um, for the public. Um, uh, so, you know, one piece at a time, we're slowly unraveling this wreck. The one thing I can guarantee for certain though, is that this is not a recent shipwreck. Things do not preserve in this kind of deteriorated state when they're recent. Ship's lead sheathing is an old technology. Um, so just based on the very cursory examination, you can tell that this is a significant shipwreck of deep antiquity. Um, since I'd like to make the point that archaeology is, is archaeology, um, you have underwater archaeology, which is a sub-sub discipline, but archaeology is archaeology. So we'll use a terrestrial example since most of uh, the world's resources are on land. Whenever you go to a site and you're, let's say, on survey for a project, a cultural resource project, let's say it's a highway, they're going to expand a highway. You find a new archeological site, uh, maybe let's say it's an artifact scatter, well, a prehistoric site, it would be um, chipped stone artifacts. So you come upon this site, you see chipped stone on the surface and you see, you then look at the, the environmental, um, you know, morphology of the local landscape and you say, where am I likely to find buried materials? And so if you see a scoured deflated area that's eroded and washed away and has large gravels, you might say, okay, that looks like um, a deflation or an erosional area, less likely to contain deposits, cultural deposits. But then you see a big cut bank with clear layers of sediment and maybe even a little charcoal coming out of that cut bank. Immediately you think, okay, we have the potential for subsurface deposits. The reason why subsurface is so important is because items that are on the surface are mixed. Um, rain, weather, you know, in this case, current um, storm action, move and redeposit these items. So they'll still tell you a rough story of the ship or the site, if you will, but the buried stuff is usually preserved. And so you can get a snapshot of a prehistoric campsite or a historic shipwreck, unlike, um, you know, most sites. Um, so buried potential is one of the things as an archeologist, we first hope to, once we evaluate the nature and extent of the site, um, well, really the extent, um, how, how, how far can we see it on the surface? We evaluate the nature of the site and subsurface deposits give you the best nature of the site. What is it? Because it's essentially a capsule. Granted, it might not be a perfect encapsulation of that moment in time, but you'd be surprised when things get buried, how intact they may remain. There's, there's prehistoric campsites that are 10, 12,000 years old because of their preservational environment, which was conducive to burying. We excavate them and we find, you know, the fire pit here, the butchered rabbit there, the tools that were used right next to it. I mean, you literally get a pretty close approximation of the campsite 10,000 years ago. And so knowing that whenever you know that you have sediment above a bedrock or above a regolith, you know that there's potential for, potential for buried deposits. Considering that there's at least eight feet of sediment atop bedrock in and around the main ballast pile, as an archeologist, I would say that is a high potential for intact subsurface cultural deposits, which archeologically speaking is ideal. It's what we're looking for, you know? So this wreck having 
seen it several times on, just on cursory examination and the, and the knowledge that I have from their uh, benthic survey, I would, if I were to write a CRM report, I would say to the uh, overseeing agency that this site has a high potential for intact subsurface cultural deposits, thus making it eligible or what have you. It's uh, significant. Mm -hmm. This site definitely, definitely has that. It has obvious antiquity. Um, it's a large site and it has buried potential. So, I mean, I don't know what more you could hope for. Honestly, um, it's a little overwhelming at times because that's why I think we're going to need so many academics and other people to weigh in on this over time. Um, once we have, a, I mean, we don't, we, our information is limited at this point. So once we have something more to bring to the table, it would be great because a lot of great minds are going to be needed to really um, interpret this information.